Although the goal of the research team was only to approach a tailplane stall, the crew did experience a full stall during a maneuver in which power was increased. Let's take a look. Very, very hard to control speed and even attitude in the airplane. The force is going up as high as probably around 80 pounds randomly, and I can't add any more power to it at this point. Yeah, we've got there we are, we have to stop. Flaps up. They're already moving, okay? The tail stall occurred to us in the uh, process of performing a power transition maneuver. The control force is built very rapidly. The nose pitched over at a very high rate. We all got very light in our seats. The co-pilot and I immediately ap applied recovery controls. I pulled the stick full back. He immediately retracted the flaps, and I retarded the power. All this occurred in about two-tenths of a second. The nose pitched over at about a rate of 2 to 15 degrees per second and reached a nose low attitude of about 40 degrees before recovery controls finally took hold and the aircraft flew out of the uh, tail stall. We lost about 300 feet of altitude in the process. So, what are some safety techniques a pilot can use to avoid a tail stall encounter? The pilot must first correctly diagnose the problem. Although the differences between tail stall and wing stall warning signs are subtle, the recovery techniques are quite opposite. With normal wing stall, the suggested recovery procedures are to add power and relax back pressure or push forward on the yoke, depending on trim. In an impending tail stall situation, the recovery is the opposite. Pull back on the yoke, reduce flaps, and on some aircraft, ease off on power. In the intensity of a busy cockpit situation, the pilot must be able to differentiate airframe buffet from yoke buffet. Now remember, with wing buffet, you will get feedback through the seat of your pants. Another clue in differentiating tailplane stall from wing stall is the aircraft configuration and speed. If flaps are lowered at the high speed limit of flap extension and there is elevator buffet, chances are it is a tailplane icing problem. The higher the airspeed, with flaps extended, the more susceptible the aircraft is to tail stall. So, if the pilot determines that there is buffet or lightening of the controls, has difficulty in trimming, or is experiencing PIO, immediately pull the yoke back and retract flaps to the previous setting. And be judicious with power. The no-brainer is to pull the yoke back. The problem is because of the high control forces, you may have great difficulty in getting it back. Also, raise the flaps to the last position. These two actions are universal in a tail stall situation. Our research also shows that you may want to be very judicious with the use of throttles. High power settings will make the stabilizer work harder and aggravate the tail stall situation. With suspected ice contamination, apply power judiciously and maintain precise control of airspeed. And remember, avoid full extension of flaps. Even partial extension should be done at altitudes that allow recovery. Make pitch changes slowly, particularly nose down movements. Remember, lightening of the controls or PIO could be an early warning of tail stall. Also, difficulty in trimming the horizontal stabilizer may be another indicator of a tail stall condition. One or all of these symptoms may be apparent. If the aircraft is equipped with a pneumatic de-icing system, activate the system several times to try and clear the ice. Land with reduced flaps if conditions permit. While large aircraft with hydraulic controls are less susceptible to tail stall, the tactile clues, such as stick lightning or yoke shake, are greatly reduced. This means that the pilot in this type of aircraft needs to be perceptive of the more subtle clues. For example, unusual trim settings and also the possibility of pilot-induced oscillations. Let's go back and take another look at what NASA researchers experienced when they induced a tailplane stall and the corrective actions they took. Trying to get some very relatively high control forces. Oops, I got the speed down. Full, uh, all standing up, laying okay. back down. Very, very 
hard to control speed and even attitude in the airplane. The force is going up as high as probably around 80 pounds randomly, and I can't add any more power to it at this point. Yeah, we've got there we are, we have to stop. Flaps up. They're already moving, okay? We started them up as soon as it went right. over. That's it, good. Good work. Okay. All right, guys, good job. That's about as far as we're ever going to go. It should be noted that other aircraft with ice-contaminated tailplanes might not react to a power increase as dramatically as the modified DH-6 did. So, to protect your passengers, yourself, and the aircraft from encountering an ice-induced tailplane stall, remember these key points. Become acutely aware of the symptoms of tailplane icing, and be prepared to undo any configuration changes. Avoid the use of autopilot in known icing conditions. If equipped with a de-icing system, use it to clear even small amounts of ice, especially before extending flaps during final approach. You can imagine an instrument approach in icing conditions close to or at minimums. You lower the flaps, the yoke starts shaking. If you misdiagnose this as a wing stall, you and your passengers could be history. Remember, you have very little time to correctly diagnose the problem and take the proper corrective actions. When ice is a factor, there is more to consider than wing stall and drag increase. Be knowledgeable, be aware, and take the corrective actions necessary should you encounter tailplane icing. You don't want to be looked at as the probable cause in an aircraft icing accident. Remember, in almost all tailplane icing accidents, the cockpit hits the ground first.